I moved north in 73 The war was still going strong So I found a job Rolling steel in a foundry in Homestead Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The hardest working man in Pittsburgh. Mr. Joe Grishecki, there, everybody.
Joe, we have a few questions for you today. Go ahead. All right then. Uh, what do you think you're, uh, you have contributed as a musician to the rock and roll? Well, in Pittsburgh, you know, we've been a mainstay of the Pittsburgh music scene since the mid-70s. You know, we're the first band to really break through on a national level in quite some time in Pittsburgh. Uh, Downer City Hosh Rockers were known everywhere in uh, the 70s to the mid-80s. We've you know, worked with a lot of real-life rock and roll Hall of Famers, uh, and we've been playing ever since in Pittsburgh. I think nationally, uh, my contribution is probably did my lyric. My lyrics about the common man and uh, you know the plight of the working class here in Pittsburgh. I think that uh, you know we had a lot of that conversation. All right, thank you for that. That's a great answer. Now the Iron City House Rockers they had a unique sound for the late '70s and early '80s. Uh, what made you guys want to set yourselves apart from the hair from the hairspray bands of the early '80s, like Poison and White Snake? Well. You know, I always looked at my music as a sort of um, a continuation of everything that came before us. You know, I never thought that, uh, you know, we were tremendous innovators as far as sound yeah. was, but I wanted to play, I wanted to play roots music. And, uh, you know, what I found since, you know, following music my whole life, you know, is the whole cliche, what, what's hit today soon becomes mm -hmm. passe. So there's, there's a couple Records, if you listen to it, one of my records sounds like 1980, and that's probably one of the least favorite of my records. If you put the, the rest of the records on, we have a pretty consistent sound, and I think that's what makes things last for a long time. You just don't go for the cheap, the cheap thing, you know, and just, just uh, try to be what's hip today. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we certainly listen to everything, but you know, our, our music is all rooted in, 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 in you know, the traditional rock and roll blues, country, all that kind of stuff. So we're pretty much stuck with that. So we've been able to uh, actually survive every every uh, every uh, you know new uh, sound that's come down a, down a pike for you know since you know since we started. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Ryan, you want to take a word from here? Yes, I will. Um, has there ever been an influence from where you came from or where you've been? Well, when I grew up, you know, I listened to the, all the classic people, and, uh, you know, like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, Van Morrison, you know, every, everything that was, you know, Motown, Stax, Muddy Waters, Holland Wolf. You know, people always ask me, you know, what's your favorite? I, I can't really name them because I, I just loved everything when I was growing up. But in Pittsburgh, there was a unique sound here in Pittsburgh that that I thought the Iron City Hosh Rockers sort of embodied for a while, which is really dirty, low down, rhythm and blues, blues, you know, real aggressive music that, uh, that was unique to Pittsburgh when I was growing up, when I was your age, they were playing, playing stuff that was, just wasn't played anywhere else in the country. But, uh, you know, there was a different era when there was a lot of independent AM stations that just played anything they wanted to play. Now it's, you know, pretty much homogenized all over the country. That's, that's, so Pittsburgh really influenced me. That's a, that's a good answer. Um, wh when I went ahead and looked up your name on the internet, I came across some name changes where it was oh, yeah. the Iron City House Rockers, and then it came to be Joe Grishecki and the House Rockers, and then you did some solo work. Well, we were the Iron City House Rockers uh, initially. And um, our, our manager, in, in his wisdom, had got us to change our name to the Iron City House Rockers, uh, which was a good move on his part because we really became identified with Pittsburgh. But after that band broke up, uh, when I started recording again after about a two or three year hiatus, I was just going to go out as Joe Grishecki. But the record company I was with at that time said, if we uh, just say we signed Joe Grishecki, we had very little recognition. But if we said we signed the guy from the Iron City Hosh Rockers, then everybody knew who we were since we were, you know, part of the national scene at that time. So it was sort of a compromise, Joe Grishecki and the Hosh Rockers, you know, trying to get a bit of uh, recognition of, of, of our accomplishments in the past. And uh, But now when I record, uh, when I record with my band and use my band as a primary 
uh, source of musicians. I call it Joker Shaking House Rockers, but there's a lot of stuff that I like to do just on my own, and I just use my own name because uh, I'm not using my band. So there's, yes, so I'm actually under three monikers now. Max? Yeah, yeah, I'll take you from here. Uh, so we were talking about the era that you were around in. Uh, now, you guys did have a comeback in the early 90s. Yeah, late 80s, early 90s, yeah, we started coming back. Uh, did you notice the music had changed a little bit back then? Yes, it had changed dramatically. I mean, yeah, the grunge had like come said, in. Well, you know, the grunge had come in, and, uh, you know, Pittsburgh didn't have that identifiable sound. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the bands like uh, myself and uh, Billy Price, and, you know, the silencers, you know, we really had a, a, we couldn't have been from anywhere else besides Pittsburgh. So things have changed a lot. You know, we were older, and we had lost a lot of our audience when the steel mills went down. Yeah. And people forget how many, how much population that Pittsburgh had lost uh, in the 80s yeah. when all the steel mills were so, so, you know, there was like a, a scattering of the tribes. And it's my theory that that's why there's so many steeler bars around the country. <laughs> right, thank you for that. So it was different, yeah. yeah. Now, as I was saying, grunge, you know, it came in, it started with the mid '80s, I want to say. Yeah, probably. Yeah, about that time. And you know, it was a unique sound. Uh, what are your thoughts on grunge? It was one of my favorites. You know, uh, that just didn't speak to me yeah. personally. Yeah. You know? uh, there's some good bands. I mean, Nirvana was a great band. Yeah. Uh, I like Pearl Jam. But the rest of them, uh, I can't say that I'm a fan. Yeah. I, uh, thank you for that. That's very. That's very informative. Uh, so you were naming some hall, uh, so you said uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Famers that you worked with. Yeah. Uh, Springsteen, obviously. Bruce Springsteen. Uh, any others? Well, Steve Cropper, who, who you guys probably never heard of, but for me, he was like, if you would ask Jimi Hendrix, who's your favorite guitar player, I'd say Steve Cropper. Wow. Keith Townsend, who's your favorite guitar player, Steve Cropper. Keith Richards, who's your favorite guitar player, Steve Cropper. That's amazing. So Steve played the uh, Booker T and the MGs, and if you listen to any kind of radio, he's all, he's, they're still playing Green Onions. He, he, he wrote Doc the Bay with Otis Redding. He wrote uh, In the Midnight Hour, he wrote Knock on Wood. He just wrote one song after another. And he was just a tremendous guitar player. So he produced, uh, he produced a record for us called Blood on the Bricks. Steve Van Zandt, who's a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, is an E Street band. He, he worked on Have a Good Time to Get Out Alive. Ian Hunter, who had a great solo career, he's still playing and played with Monte Hoople, who produced one of our records, and uh, a really great guitar player, uh, Mick Bronson, who worked with uh, David Bowie, who was on Spiders from Mars, and did uh, you know, the classic Jack and Diane, and John Cougar yeah. Mellicamp, he, he produced that record, so he worked, he worked with us. And, and of course, Bruce, so, so there's, yeah. there's three Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, and two that should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Famers. So we had the you know, privilege of working with really good people. And I know it's like a lot of those guys, they have worked on different styles, uh, different styles of music. You right. know? Uh, uh, one of my questions I wrote down was, what part of rock and roll evolution do you think you're a part of? I mean, obviously, Black Sabbath, to elaborate on that, Black Sabbath, they found a heavy metal. Yeah. And grunge was really started by like the Ramones back in the late 70s. And morphed into something. It was. Well, we, we're just, you know, I like to think, we're, you know, we're just pretty much traditional. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't think we're, we're that tremendously innovative uh, musically. You know, we're just keeping the flame alive, you know. But uh, if you listen to, to my records, I like to think that I have, you know, you can listen to you, there's some soul in it, you can hear some blues in it, you can hear some rock and roll, you can hear some, you know, good lyrics, you can hear some. Even some country playing with my yeah. Western Pennsylvania <laughs> accent, so sort of like uh, sort of like Zeppelin did back in the late sixties. Yeah, it, 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 not really. I'm not really influenced by heavy metal that yeah. much. I sort of, when I was younger, you know, we had hair down to the wazoo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, I sort of grew that stage. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm into good singing, good playing, good lyrics. 
You know, I, I, I like stuff that's meaningful, but we also like to get really stupid and have fun and dance and do stuff. So we're a combination of a lot of different things. All right, that's a great answer. Thank you so much for that. Um, Mr. Grishek, I did a little research, some more research than the name changing, and I came across some, like the year you started to work, the year you came alive, like how, what did that do for you as a person? Coming when we first signed our record deal? Yeah, like. Well, I'll tell you what, it changed everything for us, because, uh, you know, in those days, there were, there were very little, minimal home recording and doing it yourself. You know, there, there was no internet. If you wanted to have a, uh, a career, you had, had to be on a record company. And to get signed to a major label was just, you know, it was out of this world. And, and I can remember, I was actually on Broadway Avenue in uh, the old Hall of Woods Music, and somebody came up to me and said, hey, you're in Rolling Stone magazine. Well, I, I about fell over because Rolling Stone magazine was like the Bible yeah. Of, yeah. of rock and roll. And, and they, they gave our first record just a this tremendous uh, review. And uh, I can remember, I could, they actually had it at the radio station before I got it. And we drove down, uh, WDB was in, right off of Liberty Avenue downtown. We went down and played the record for us. And they gave us a copy. And I can remember going back to my house just looking at that, just holding it in my hand, just, it was like a dream come true. And, uh, you know, it was really a highlight for me. And, and, and I'm very, very thankful that I got to do that. And uh, after that, it was sort of, you have to figure out how to survive in the business. Yeah. But I was, you know, I, I've always played music because I love to play music. And you know, people say, uh, you know, how'd you choose it for a career? I, I didn't choose it as a career, it chose me. I've always had a, a band going on in my head, you know, just to be able to play is all I wanted to do, really. All right, so thank you once again for uh, playing for us earlier. That was great. Uh, we're going to ask you to play one more song, Mr. G, but there's one question we got to ask you before that. Uh, you were earlier, you said uh, you were walking through McKee's Rocks and somebody came up to you and said, Your picture's in Rolling, you're in Rolling Stone. Uh, now, as a musician, you told us that you come from a long line. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to your family, to you as a person? Well, you know, you know we talk about our music, and if, if you go through the lyrics of, in our songs, it, it, it really tells a story of Pittsburgh. You know, my family, the city, my friends. Uh, we've always been very, very involved in the community. Uh, you know, I come from a long line of musicians. My grandfather was a musician, he was supposed to be a very, very talented violinist. Uh, my mother was a singer and a dancer. My father played just about any instrument you could name. And uh, he was a professional musician. He had a radio show back in, in the day, you know, before the war, World War II. Uh, my son plays, my daughter is very talented. The music has always been my family's uh, way of communicating bringing the family together. And we've always been very, very involved in, in the community. I've raised millions, literally millions of dollars for every charity you could, you could name. Uh, even Snow Rocks, we've we'll raised money for Snow Rocks. Uh, we, we always think our band and the guys in our band, and uh, we always think giving back to the community and being part of the community is part of what we do. We always feel like uh, we like to belong to Pittsburgh. All right, thank you for that. Uh, what song do you want to play for us next? Well, I'm going to do a song, sort of my signature song called Pump and Iron. Pump and Iron? Yeah. All right, that sounds song. great. This is for Mr. Speedhar. You ready? Jimmy was a rocker, oh how he liked to rock, hold his head just right, practice the way he talked, he's gonna go out tonight, make a little noise. He was a steel driving man, just like his daddy was, didn't have a choice, just do what he's told, but if you hear me. Just right. 
Brothers. Did you ever see the Blues Brothers where they had a chicken wire in front of them? Guys were throwing stuff at us. They threw road flares at us. They ripped up the chairs, threw the chairs at us, threw bottles at us. We almost got killed. But it, it was funny now looking back on it, but it was, we were glad to get out alive. <laughs> I can imagine metalheads from the 80s yeah. throwing stuff at you. All right, next question. Um, in, in the area where you live, we live in Pittsburgh, right? Right. You're a rock and roll Hall of Famer, and you're yeah. and such an iconic person for the whole rock and roll Pittsburgh. Like, what what does that make? You, how does that make you feel? Well, you know, to get that award actually made me feel pretty good. I, I thought it was uh, it's, it's nice to be noticed for what you did, and you know, and, and uh, I guess awarded, but. You know, it, 
I, I knew the Pittsburgh musical community is tight. You know, it's it's nice that, that other people were appreciated our work. You know, we worked hard over the years, and so it was nice. It's very nice to, to get that award. I was, I was very happy. With it. Like being where you are now, and you look back on everything that you've done, would you say that it was all worth it? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean. My, my dream, I, told, I told, said the other, the last interview, it was just to make a record. And everything after getting that first record in my hands sort of been icing on the cake, you know. Once you get in the music business, you have to, you know, there's a lot of twists and turns. And, you know, you, one thing that always held us back, we, after our first management deal sort of blew up, we never had really, really good effective management. And if you look at anybody that's really, you know, climbed to the top, they've always had a really, really strong management team. And, uh, you know, but it just didn't work out that way for us. That's good. That's all I got. That's all you got? Okay. So, you know, uh, speaking of here, you know, we talked about that a little bit yesterday, but you grew up in, what, 50s, 60s? In the 60s. In the 60s. Yeah. Uh, what were some artists that influenced you? You know, just everybody. You know, I, I just, I've loved music since I can remember. I always, you know, always just wanted to play music. And, I mean, just everybody, even before the Beatles, you know, I was into all the Motown stuff. And, you know, just four seasons. And, but, you know, like, probably like most guys in my generation, when I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show with actual guitars in their hands, but the, but then the Rolling Stones sort of sealed the deal because the Rolling Stones uh, played music that was somewhat easier to play. I mean, the Beatles were like too perfect, you know. I, I could never be a Beatle, but I, I could have been a Rolling Stone. So, so <laughs> once you know, once I got a guitar in my hand, that that was pretty much it. All right. Um, now, a good question for that I thought of was, in all reality. Was Pitt, is Pittsburgh the place you really wanted to be all your life? Well, you know, we, we had opportunities to move, and we didn't. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't know if our career would have been different than, uh, probably would have been just, you know, coming out of the Iron City House, I think we were a pretty hot commodity. Yeah. And if there was any time to move, that, that probably should have been the time. But, you know, we, you know, I'm a Pittsburgh guy. I was like, I liked it here. You know, I wanted to stay with my family and stuff, so I stayed here. Does, does, does family come first? In Pretty home? much, yeah. You know, the, the rock and roll stuff. You got to realize that you know, you're just a musician. You know, anybody thinks that they're above the rest of the people just because they play guitar. It's just, you know, it's blowing smoke as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, yeah, you, you know, real life's more important. Uh, you know, yesterday you said you were more of a traditionalist in your music, like following See, you saw rock and roll as something that really didn't need to change that much. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you try to, I always try to put my own spin on it, yeah. you know, I never really try to, to just, you know, copy it, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, what I meant by that was like, you never yeah. tried to, you always went your own way, but you never tried to change roots rock and roll you know no, I, i'm pretty much a root guy yeah. you know I, you know i i like to think you could you could follow my music back to the mississippi delta you yeah. know you know i'm a white guy from pittsburgh but you know I, you know my roots are in the blues and country and, yeah know, like chuck Berry. yeah that's Richard what i was gonna say so uh, i mean i noticed that about the afternoon you played yesterday i noticed like you really didn't change anything from uh, like it's your music really stay in contact with blues and jazz roots of when rock was first coming out. Well, yeah, I do, actually. Shut my phone off here. <laughs> Is there any questions from the crowd? We have one by Nico, right? Go to Rubio. All right. Nico, I have your question here. Does playing in different places change how you play or make music mean something different to you? Like, how... How do you, how do the different crowds influence you? Well, George Burns, who's like a 
old performer played to like 90 years old. And both Keith Richards said, you know, the best band in the world or the best performer in the world on any given night is as good as his audience. You know, so so there's sometimes when you have like a tremendous audience, it just takes takes the whole energy level of the band to a different spot. But one thing that we prided ourselves on uh, with my band is if there's 10 people there or 10,000 people there, we try to give it our all every night. So I try to play every gig like it's the last gig I'm ever gonna play because if I don't play good and I don't feel that I've performed up to my standards I set for myself, it bothers me. And then I can't wait to do the next gig so, so that sort of gets that bad taste out of my mouth. So, so we try to be consistent every night when we play. We try to play as hard as we can. And, you know, I, I like to always tell people that, that my career is based on self-satisfaction. I like to feel good about what I'm doing. That's great. <laughs> Mr. Spihar. Are there any particular locations here in Pittsburgh or nationally or internationally that are still active? or have gone away that rank among your favorite venues to well, perform in? Probably my favorite venue I've ever played in Pittsburgh was a club called The Decade. And we played there, it sort of like was the hub of the Pittsburgh music scene when it broke big. We played there, we started on Thursday nights and we played Thursdays and Saturdays for a long time. And Thursday nights was everybody's and their friends and buddies, you know, a couple hundred people. Saturdays, there was lines around the block and that was a great place for us to play. New Jersey right now, New Jersey, uh, uh, I'm sort of adopted son in Asbury Park, New Jersey, so New Jersey gigs are always great. In Spain, we played in Spain a lot. Uh, I played probably more gigs in Spain than I did in most American cities. I you know, played like 50 some gigs in Spain. Spain was their uh, audiences are off the charts. Are very passionate about their music. So, with all my favorite places. With all that being said, if you had to pick one place that you that was just over the top, over all the others, where would it be? Well, uh, you know, we, we, we've done some dates here at Soldiers and Sailors in Bruce Springsteen. were pretty incredible. But one of the wildest gigs we ever played. Uh, uh, I still remember this. It was a place in uh, Spain called the Tombstone Club in Terrassa, Spain. At the end of the night, the whole place was just pandemonium. It was more than a job, it was my family. I got married, settled down.